Welcome back. Um, I am very pleased um, to introduce a returning UC veteran. <laughs> Clark has been, been our guest before, and we're delighted to have him back. So Clark McCoy, the floor is yours. Pleased to be back in the sunshine, I can tell you. Well, the bottom line of my story today was going to be something that is common currency of the last two or three speakers, so I'll just mention it here at the beginning. Uh, I think the way to think about terrorism is politics. And if you just do that, a whole lot of other things fall into place. But I got a few details that I can <laughs> mention to you. Uh, this paper is about looking at some of the definitions of terrorism that are current uh, and then noticing out loud the costs of this kind of definition. So, you know, just briefly, I look at the United Nations would-be Convention on International Terrorism, which is still on the table because it's not clear it might, appear, might apply to states as well as non-state groups, and you could see how that would be a slowdown. From the United Kingdom, from the FBI, the Department of Defense, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, the Patriot Act of 2001. Every one of these has the idea of an intent to create fear and to coerce a government or a citizenry. The only one I could find in the US government that doesn't include fear and coercion is one from the US Code of Federal Regulations, premeditated politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational groups or clandestine agents usually intended to influence an audience. Just to show you that that's not like an incredible frame, I can mention to you that it's very close to Martha Crenshaw's 1995 definition. Terrorism is a conspiratorial style of violence calculated to alter the attitudes and behavior of multiple audiences. It targets the few in a way that claims the attention of the many. Terrorism is not mass or collective violence, but rather the direct activity of small groups. Well, you know, I want to say that there are three kinds of cost associated with defining terrorism as including the definition, in the definition, the intent to create fear and coercion. I mean, states through history have used fear and coercion to control populations and areas. This is not a new idea. It's the projection of the state practice to small groups that I think is worth our attention. The first consequence of this kind of definition is it makes terrorist motivations very difficult to analyze. When you put the supposed motive, the hypothetical motive, for a terrorist attack in the very definition of the phenomenon to be explained, you're going to have a lot of troubles. I mean, no social scientist would put a hypothetical explanation of the phenomenon in the definition of the phenomenon of interest. Nobody, nobody would do that. But it's the common practice, like six out of the seven definitions I found are doing that very bizarre thing from a social science point of view. The second consequence, the second kind of blindness that comes out of this definition is it focuses on fear as the key emotion for understanding and resisting terrorism. Terrorists want to terrorize. If the target of terrorist attacks, both the government and its citizens, can resist being intimidated, then the terrorists cannot succeed. How better to demonstrate the conquest of fear than to strike back against the terrorists? to mobilize new resources, strengthen government power, in short, to declare war on terrorism. 
Unfortunately, I'm here to tell you, that terrorists count on anger and outrage at least as much, and I believe more, than they count on fear. I'll more about that in a minute. A third and related blindness of including fear and coercion in the definition of terrorism is that citizens are misled about how terrorism is dangerous. Now, you know, David was going right down this line, so here's not a new thought, just another angle on the same thought. I mean, most people who study terrorism understand that fear and coercion are not the only goals of terrorists and terrorist attacks, but the citizens who read and hear government definitions of terrorism, especially as these definitions are embodied in the opinions of politicians and pundits, citizens are led to believe that as long as they don't give in to fear, as long as they support war against terrorists, they've done their best. So now I want to talk about the costs of this misplaced confidence. Think back to the results of the 9-11 attacks on US politics. Increased patriotism, rallies, flags, banners, bumper stickers, polls showing increased support for the president and every agent and agency of the government, increased sanctions for Americans challenging the consensus, poor Bill Mayer losing his job. The reification of American values, quote, they hate us for our values. Now I want to think about the emotions associated with the attacks. There's an innovative study by Bak Kufner Egloff, 2010. They got hold of millions of words of texts sent in the US on September 11th. And they basically searched through with the computer and pulled out all the emotion-related words. Anger-related words increased throughout the day, ending six times higher than fear and sadness-related words. So the predominant emotional response in these off-the-cuff texts of everyday Americans, it's anger is the predominant emotional response, not fear and not sadness. Furthermore, now I've, this has got some details, so I want to read it to get it exact. Experiments described by Weatherell et al. in 2013 show that individuals responding to images of the 9-11 attacks with anger are more likely to favor aggressive reactions to terrorism, whereas reactions of fear and sadness are related to support for more defensive reactions. Across several studies show that anger reactions are related to support for attacking terrorist leaders in foreign countries, war against countries harboring terrorists, outgroup derogation of Arab Americans and Palestinians, but in other studies, fear reactions, people with the strongest fear reports, were, were associated with increased support for government surveillance and restriction of civil liberties. So it makes a difference, you see, what kind of emotion reaction you're looking at. Anger gets you revenge, retribution, aggression. Fear gets you, got to give government more power, more surveillance to protect us. So I want to argue, too, that anger is the emotion sought by terrorists who want to get an overreaction to their attacks, using the enemy's strength against them in a strategy that Sophia and I have called jujitsu politics. You use the enemy's strength against them. You elicit from the enemy a reaction that does your work for you in mobilizing people on your side. And that's what the terrorists want. There's a long history of how this idea could have seemed reasonable. In 86, the US bombed Gaddafi, trying to miss Gaddafi, hit a nearby apartment building, killed a number of women and children. This mistake was downplayed in the US press, but it was a public relations success for anti-US groups all across North Africa. In 98, the U.S. attempted to reply to the Al-Qaeda attacks on U.S. embassies in Africa by sending cruise missiles against a weapons factory in Sudan, against Al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan. Turned out the weapons factory was making medical supplies, more fuel for anti-U.S. feelings. And worse yet, the cruise missiles landing in Afghanistan blew off the table a deal in which Afghanistan's Taliban would turn over Osama bin Laden and other of his troublesome Arabs to Saudi Arabia, where the Saudis were still smarting from bin Laden's criticisms. So the cost of this was considerable. 
So here's the Al Qaeda leadership watching this happen, learning how overreaction can do their work for them. And we got direct quotations from Dr. Ayman al Zawahiri. He enunciates the strategy of jiu-jitsu politics in his memoir, Knights Under the Prophet's Banner. If the shrapnel of war reach American homes, he opined, Americans must either give up their control of Muslim countries or come out from behind their Muslim stooges to fight for control. If Americans move troops into Muslim countries, he predicted, the result would be a magnet for jihad of the kind the Russians faced in Afghanistan. So the US war against the Taliban was faster and cleaner of collateral damage to civilians than Al-Qaeda had expected, but the US move into Iraq did the job in bringing new support for terrorists and Al-Qaeda in particular. And, you know, everybody's entitled to a slightly different view of what happened in Paris, but my interpretation of this is just as we heard, minute ago, you got to consider the multiple audiences. For Sunni Muslims chafing under Shia power in Iraq and Syria, the message is power. ISIS can best defend Sunnis because ISIS has the most power. For young Sunni men in the Middle East, the message is don't think about joining moderate Sunni rebels, don't think about joining a tribal militia, join the winning team, join ISIS. For Muslims in Europe, there is also a message of power, but more important, there's jiu-jitsu politics. ISIS trying to use Western strength against the West. A response to terrorism that creates collateral damage that harms individuals, individuals previously unsympathetic to the terrorists can bring new status, new volunteers for the terrorists. This is what I believe is the major result ISIS sought from the Paris attacks. And here I think I'm echoing what Mark already said, so I'm gonna cut right through uh, this part but they wanted increased discrimination and hostility aimed at European Muslims. And they're getting it, best I can make out. In fact, they're even getting increased hostility toward Muslims in the US of A. You can read it in the front page of the New York Times a few days. So I think it's working pretty well for them. And it's working because we're too stupid to see the point. And part of how we're too stupid to see the point is we got the wrong definition. We're focused on fear and coercion. We don't understand about the power of anger and outrage. We don't see that that's at the bottom of where their power is. They want to build a wall between Muslims and the rest of the world, and especially in Europe and even in the US. And they do that by getting the rest of us to react against Muslims. It's working like a charm. Well, you know, the worst of this, I think, is when you define the enemy as fundamentalist Muslims. Marine Le Pen, you all know who she is, the leader of the anti-immigrant party in France, offered this target in an interview with NPR's Robert Siegel. Quote, we must eradicate Islamic fundamentalism from our soil, unquote. Siegel didn't challenge Le Pen's definition of the problem, but the fact is the great majority of Islamic fundamentalists are devout rather than political. Defining religious ideas and religious practices as the enemy will attack 99 peaceful Muslims for every jihadist reached, and jiu-jitsu politics will be winning. Now, once you start thinking about this action and reaction sequence that is jiu-jitsu politics, it sensitizes you to a larger point, the dynamic perspective, that you can't understand terrorism is something out there. Terrorism is part of a reaction, action, reaction sequence that goes on, goes on over time, in which what we do is just as important as what they do. And we'll know that there's the beginning of a recognition of this importance when we start having databases of what the government does in response to terrorism. I mean, we got all these databases about what the terrorists do. Where are the databases of what the governments do in response to terrorism? Well, if we can't even keep track of what we're doing in response to terrorism, how are we ever going to figure out what works and what doesn't work? We don't even know what we did. Still, there's a problem left, I think. Why are we so blind? So first, I thought it was just stupidity. And then I thought, no, it's because the US is so powerful that we can ignore thinking through the problem. I think even that's not enough. Uh, I think our blindness is not an accident. 
of asymmetric conflict. It's not an accident of being strong enough to afford not thinking. I think it's a motivated blindness. Not seeing the interaction, the back and forth, the dynamic, saves our self-image as blameless victims and eases our way to violence in return. Not just boots on the ground, but assassinations from the air and torture in the prisons. Seeing conflict as an interaction humanizes the enemy, where heroic resistance to fear and coercion makes monsters. And now I just want to point out that the US Army and Marine Corps are doing better than the terrorism community in this regard. You can look at their new Army field manual, the new counterinsurgency field manual, now back to 2006. And this manual gives close attention to the insurgent strategy that aims to mobilize new support by eliciting government overreaction to insurgent attacks. The need to counter this strategy of jujitsu politics comes through in the first five paradoxes of the counterinsurgency operations. Sometimes the more you protect, the less secure. Sometimes the more force, the less effective. The more successful the counterinsurgency is, the less force can be used. Sometimes doing nothing is the best reaction. Some of the best weapons for counterinsurgents do not shoot. So earlier, we were worried about the distinction, if there is one, between insurgency and terrorism. And I'd rather emphasize their similarity here because they're both political conflicts. That's what's at the bottom of both insurgency and terrorism. And you can't understand either one of these and you can't respond adequately for either one of these kinds of problems unless you recognize that it's a political conflict, unless you recognize that what you do is as important as what they do. And I think Mao Zedong had it right. The best short summary of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism is politics takes command. I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Clark. Um, as, as one of the people whose definition you're implicitly um, critiquing. Oh, I was hoping to be more explicit than that. <laughs> but you didn't. You said Martha. <laughs> it's fine. It's no, fine. Martha's definition doesn't have coercion or I, fear I know, in it. I know. Um, but she's, hers is the one you mentioned. But in any case, in, by name other than the, the government. But I think everything you said, which following the discussion of definition comes what, whatever definition we use. I don't, think, I don't think the problem is the definition of terrorism. Not to, this is not to defend my definition or anyone else's, but rather I don't think in this case in terms of your analysis, which I find compelling, is, is based on the definition. Um, it's, it is based more on how one responds to a particular act and whether or not you recognize, as you suggest, that it's the, the emotional reactions and the choices that are made by the people who are attacked or the audience that views the attack that is far more important than, in terms of determining what the impact of the original event is than the event itself. And it's in that area that we constantly, collectively constantly fail. And whether or not if it's fear, the fear causes anger or it's, one moves straight to anger. Um, I think it's less relevant in that case. Well, then you don't believe that the way we talk about terrorism affects the public opinion about what this problem is and affects what is the art of the possible politically in responding to this problem. Because that's where I think the, the definition really comes into play. You tell people over and over again, terrorism, they're threatening us, they're trying to make us afraid, they're trying to coerce us into doing what we would not otherwise do to give them something. And if that is the way the American public understands the problem with terrorism, then why not war? Anything that shows that we're not afraid. The answer to our problem is fear. And we all we have to do is fight back. So I think that the public relations side of this, the public problem that comes out of the kind of definition that is dominant today is a real problem. It's, it's not a research problem, it's a political problem, is what I'm trying to say. No, no, and I do agree with you, but I would just use one example. One can respond um, 
in, and has a choice, uh, say the British response after 7-7 versus uh, the American response after 9-11. After the British uh, decided that for all the surveillance, obviously already existed, but more, there would be more of it, et cetera, et cetera. But they took a law enforcement approach as opposed to a military approach. Um, and those are choices. Those are both political choices. Um, you, can, you can respond, you can, you can do all kinds of things, but you can have, A, a stiff upper lip um, and, and respond and show no fear without, uh, without saying, I'm not doing anything. So you can, there are, it's still political choices in, in terms of how you react, and there are multiple political choices one can make, and it's not an automatic to go to the war on terror. You know they got the prevent program going over there. Absolutely. And this is another kind of error. This is the error that makes the whole problem a problem of radicalization. As if it's all just one dimension from having no ideas to having some radical ideas, more radical ideas, and at the far end of this dimension is people doing violence and even killing civilians. But I'm here to tell you this is a mistake to think about it as one dimensional. 99% of the people with extreme ideas never do anything. And a sizable portion of people who do militant and violent things, they get to that for reasons that have nothing to do with ideology and bad ideas. And that's why Sophia and I have been trying to sell the two pyramids model. There's the radicalization of ideas and opinions uh, pyramid. There's the radicalization of action pyramid. And just like in social psychology, I've been saying for years in introductory courses, Attitudes are not the same thing as behavior. They respond to different kinds of sources and manipulations. It's not like you can just turn from attitude to action like it's automatic, like a dose of salt. But that is the implication of talking violent extremism because extremism is the noun, you see. It's extreme ideas is what we're pointing to when we talk about violent extremism. And it's radicalization of ideas that we are pointing to for most people as they understand the word when we start talking about radicalization to core. No, we got to talk about radicalization, radicalization of ideas. That's a separate problem. And radicalization of action, that's another problem. And action radicalization, that should be a problem for the security people. But putting, you know, police and uh, the, the FBI in charge of the war of ideas to fight against radicalization of the opinion pyramid. That's just crazy. I mean, they're totally incompetent to do that kind of work. But these are the kinds of confoundings that happen out of using bad words. One last question, John. Yeah, well, um, there's, um, I totally agree with you about overreaction. I've written about three books on it and so forth. And, and the, the increase of expending in the United States is over a trillion dollars. Uh, just within the United States, that nothing to do with overseas. But there's also a lot of, there's a selection bias problem because you need to deal with the times and they didn't overreact. So the two worst terrorism cases before 9-11 were the Lockery bombing in 1988. What they did was they went after the guys who did it and luckily, apparently got them eventually. So that's a question. Well, that's also. why how they Maybe. bombed Tripoli. Uh, and the, the, no, they didn't, that was. Not no, the same? No. The, 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 okay. the Tripoli bombing was, there was a reaction, that was oh, a reaction. Oh, right. that was the disco. Yeah, the disco. Well, you could so say they, it was they overreacted to the but okay, okay. They overreacted to the okay. disco, they overreacted to 9-11, they overreacted to, um, to yeah, uh, right. the, the, the um, uh, Kenya the, uh, embassy bombings. Uh, but they didn't react to that, to the, uh, and they didn't react when, the, when it, uh, Reagan, when the uh, 283 American Marines were killed. They didn't overreact to the uh, killings in the uh, Black Hawk Down period. They didn't overreact to the Fort Hood shootings. I mean, no one stopped going. No one stopped going to Fort Hood or anything. Uh, and so you got the same. You got obviously none of these are as big as 9/11. The Canadians didn't overreact when the, this, the worst case before 9/11 in general was a Canadian uh, Air India uh, um, bombing Six. by Sikhs in 1985. The Canadians didn't do much about it at all. In fact, they still don't know who did it. Um, so it's possible politically not to overreact. Uh, and uh, th sometimes they've done that. So if, if anger is so important, they, obviously people are very angry about Lockerbie. I had two of my students on there. I was angry as hell, I can assure you. Um, and, um, but but uh, they didn't overreact. So how do you... Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right, that's right. So a lot of times they don't overreact. So. Well, the first World Trade Center bombing was criminal justice only. Thank you. So I, I see what you're saying. 
that if I want to take this line seriously, I should spend more time examining the negative cases and trying to understand what's the difference beside the fact that it's just bigger. Yeah, that's a good point. I should. You're right. With that, I'm going to, in the interest of our next presenter, uh, I'm going to close this window and uh, uh, take two, two real two, a real two-minute break. Okay? Uh, and just get back on Okay, I have um, no doubt that um, the conversations will thankfully continue to be lively. We have a good number of points to uh, contest and uh, to try to help us with some more contestation. <laughs> I'm pleased to uh, introduce Steve Corman from Arizona State. Steve. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Uh, nice to be uh, here with you today. So uh, my talk, the title is a little bit different than what was in the program. So it's the narrative constructing a violent Islamism. I said extremism before, but decided I would really be talking about the Islamists. So I wanted to change uh, to that. And what I plan to do today is basically uh, offer an argument as to how I think Islamists construct violent, uh, violent action, how, how they construct violent Islamism. And I want to start with a point about how uh, uh, terrorism or violent extremism isn't strategically rational from an instrumental point of view, but that it is from a narrative point of view. And I want to talk about uh, the co concept of narrative rationality from a guy in my field. I'm a communication uh, uh, scholar. Uh, talk about some narrative concepts and then apply those ideas to the Islamist narrative system. Talk about how they link that discourse to individuals uh, before putting it all together. And just on that second to last point, I mean, the point is taken from the last uh, presentation that just because you believe something, it doesn't mean you're going to act. Uh, that's certainly true, but it's not as if those things are unrelated either. So you have to have the ideation, I think, in order to undertake the action. So this is still something important uh, to understand. So uh, is terrorism rational? Uh, I'm not a political scientist or an uh, economist, but uh, I, I've looked at a lot of discussion of this topic in economics and political science, and gosh, there sure is a lot of it. It seems to focus on whether terrorists behave, behave as uh, economically rational individuals. Uh, generally, it seems to be individual focus, and, and for some reason, especially on uh, suicide bombers. And uh, a lot of uh, differences lead to differences of opinion about whether it's rational action or not. So uh, it's uh, depending on whether you're focusing on supporters or terrorists or individual suicide bombers, for example, you might say it's rational or not. Uh, you might say it's rational or not depending on the nature of the payoff that's being considered. So is it a, a material payoff? Is it a spiritual payoff uh, or what? So uh, generally, it, it seems to me it's focused on the individual level. I'd like to focus on an organizational version of the same question. So is, it, is terrorism strategically uh, rational? So str a strategy, of course, is ever relating to a plan that's created to achieve a goal. Uh, and there seems to be relatively little academic consideration of this. There are a few things out there. Um, uh, Abrams is one of the people who's addressed it. I'll, I'll mention him in just a little bit. Uh, but, but relatively little compared to the other rational discussion. So I'd like to examine this and especially focus on contemporary uh, Islamist groups. So one way we could think about whether um, uh, violent Islamism is uh, strategically rational is to ask whether these people accomplish their goals. And it turns out uh, a few years ago, uh, Jones and Leblik, Le Lebicki, Leblicki, uh, at RAND uh, published a fairly uh, comprehensive study of this using the uh, uh, Terrorism Events Database, uh, looking at 648 groups from 1968 to 2006. Uh, what they found is only 10% uh, of the terrorist groups won, uh, so got what they were after. Importantly, none of the religious groups achieved their objectives in the, in the groups they looked at. That, of course, stopped in 2006, but I'm not aware of any religious groups that have achieved their objectives since then. 
most terrorist groups end, they said, with a transition to a political process. However, that's only for groups with narrow goals. So maybe to get a representation of a, uh, uh, for a particular ethnic group or something like that. Groups with expansive goals, uh, Islamists like Al-Qaeda, for example, uh, tend not to transition to political processes. These groups are more likely to persist without winning if they're religious, I've already mentioned that, if they're involved in an insurgency, and if they're large in size. So all of that goes to say that the Islamist groups that we're most concerned about today uh, are unlikely to uh, win, and they're very likely to persist without winning. That doesn't seem strategically rational. Another thing we could ask is whether on a, um, more micro level or a more short term level, whether they accomplish um, the, the objectives they're trying to accomplish along the, role, uh, along the road to uh, 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 with, you know, achieving the overall goal. And for Islamist groups, that is to protect and defend the Ummah, the worldwide Muslim community. So we can ask, do the groups do this? And one way we could answer that is by saying, well, they don't do it if they kill the people they're trying to protect. And it turns out that all of the Islamist groups uh, kill the very people they're trying to protect. So this is a study out of the Counting, Countering Terrorism Center in 2009. They looked at al-Qaeda attacks, looked at the Western victims versus the non-Western victims, and non-Western, in this case, uh, is almost all Muslim. And as you can see, al-Qaeda attacks uh, kill more Muslims than anybody else. Situation is the same for the Taliban. Uh, this is from the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, who has been collecting data since 2009 on civilian casualties in that region. And as we can see, for every year they reported data, uh, two, uh, you know, the, the, the anti-government uh, elements, that's the Taliban basically, uh, kill uh, two to three times as many people as the pro-government forces and other uh, groups there. So uh, here again, they're killing the people they protect. Now we don't have so much data on other groups, but uh, anecdotally, the United Nations Assistance Mission, Assistance Mission in Iraq uh, talks about how in areas under its control, Daesh basically uh, kills many Sunni Muslims who won't pledge allegiance or won't play along. Uh, they, they kill captured uh, members of government forces, some of whom are Sunni. Uh, Boko Haram, according to the African Studies Center, uh, kills uh, two Muslims for every one non-Muslim they kill. And even al-Shabaab, who uh, has lately adopted a practice of explicitly not killing Muslims, asking people if they're Muslim or not, or giving them a test before they shoot them, uh, even they uh, kill uh, Muslims. Uh, so on this criterion, uh, uh, it's, it's not strategically rational either. So no, uh, these groups are not strategically rational from an instrumental point of view. They don't accomplish their long-term goals, and their actions contravene the short-term goals that are, are involved in the long-term ones. So the question is, are they strategically rational from some other point of view? And I'd like to make the argument that they are rational from a narrative point of view. And to illustrate that, I'd like to uh, um, look at uh, something called the narrative paradigm. And this was developed by uh, Walter Fisher, a guy in our field uh, back in the 80s, um, who looked at a narrative as a separate form of rationality. And he contrasted it with the logical paradigm. That's the one we use all the time, you know, where, where, we, we, where we collect uh, uh, evidence and data and debate facts and make logical conclusions and stuff like that, and contrasted that with his narrative paradigm. So in the logical paradigm, humans are thinking beings, that life is a series of logical problems, we decide things by argument, and validity is knowledge and understanding. In the narrative paradigm, on the other hand, human beings are storytellers. Life is continual recreation and telling of stories. We decide by history and culture and the stories that are embedded in them. And validity is what he calls good reasons. And he breaks that down into uh, two things, uh, coherence, which is basically how well the story hangs together, you know, logically as a story, and fidelity, which is basically the extent to which a story rings true with, uh, with respect to other stories we already know or how we think the world works. 
So that's a, that's a different sort of uh, validity criterion than, than uh, essentially the, the quality of arguments and conclusions, right? It's how well, how good of a story something is and how well it resonates with things we already know. All right. So just a few uh, 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 narrative concepts here. Uh, real quickly, a story that's an account of, uh, 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 of a sequence of related events resulting in a resolution or projected resolution. Uh, that last thing is especially important in terms of uh, groups that are trying to motivate people to do things, something that could occur but hasn't yet and we, we, we need participation to make it happen. A narrative is a story told by a particular story in a, a particular storyteller in a particular context. So that's a, that's a, a distinction made in narratology. Uh, people often use those terms interchangeably or, or, or think of a narrative as, as the second, both the, the, the story and it's being told. An important thing, especially from the Islamist point of view, is this idea of a narrative system. So that's a coherent system of interrelated and, uh, uh, and organized stories that share a common rhetorical desire to resolve a problem. And one other thing we've been looking at in our work are master narratives. Those are narrative systems, that's a narrative system that's deeply embedded in a culture and known by its members. So an example of that in American culture would be the American Revolution. If you're an American citizen, you've learned about that in grade school, you know all the stories, nobody has to tell you what the Tea Party is all about, and that's how a political group can sort of seize on that and use it to uh, uh, you know, uh, frame what they're doing and motivate people to join, okay? So uh, some narrative elements. Uh, uh, we, we have here what's generally known as the, the narrative arc. So narratives usually start with some kind of problem that's a conflict, need, or a deficiency. That creates some sort of desire in the audience to achieve some kind of resolution. And again, in a historical narrative, the resolution has happened. Uh, in a, a, a present narrative, that's projected into the future. And then there's an arc of locations, events, actions, and participants. Some of the participants are archetypes like heroes or something like that that lead from the desire to the resolution. And uh, those things uh, form a system, as I can form systems, as I just said. And that, that combination of desire, arc, and resolution uh, also results in story forms in some cases. And a couple of those are especially important in terms of um, Islamist uh, extremists. Okay. So, uh, in the narrative system of Islamist extremists, uh, first of all, we've already uh, heard this point, at this point from uh, Professor Jurgensmeyer, uh, violent Islamists see themselves as cosmic warriors. So they are engaged in a grand conflict between good and evil. Uh, for some of them, in particular Daesh, it's, a, it's an apocalyptic battle or a, a, a battle they expect to end in an apocalyptic manner. And this sort of provides a unifying theme of the conflict and desire elements in that arc I just showed you. A lot of the master narratives used by Islamist extremists uh, 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 involve evil participants, and this is from a large study we did in a five-year project funded by the U.S. Department of Defense looking at about 5,000 texts published by Al-Qaeda and related groups. Uh, some of the uh, most common uh, uh, master narratives invoked in those texts were the infidel invaders, so stories of the Crusaders and Mongols. These are groups that came into Muslim lands, uh, sacked the place, enslaved the Muslims, stole their stuff, uh, and generally uh, acted badly. Uh, also, uh, an important uh, master narrative are Muslim imposters, and you know, when they talk about the apostate regimes uh, of the Middle East, these are people who pretend to be Muslims but aren't really, they're very often puppets who are controlled by other people like the Crusaders, uh, for example, or the Jews. Uh, they do their bidding and in so, uh, in so doing help the Crusaders accomplish their goal of, of essentially uh, raping the land. The good guys in these stories uh, participate in a couple of different story forms. So one is deliverance, and this is the canonical David and Goliath story. So in a deliverance story, there's a threatener menacing the community. There's an unlikely champion that steps forward to challenge the threatener. They win, usually against long odds, and they restore the community to normalcy. Uh, hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of stories we find in the Islamist extremist texts use this story form. So, okay, so they're trying to portray themselves as these champions that are defending the Muslims um, against the threateners of the, of the Jews and Crusaders. 
Another common story form is decline. And so an example of this, for those of you who are familiar with it, is uh, Sayyid Qutb's New Jahiliya narrative. And basically, the story form here is there was a time in the past when things were perfect, but then something happened, and everything started sliding downhill, and it's gone downhill ever since. And something has to be done to get, back, get, to get things back to the way uh, it was in the good old days. Uh, the resolution, the common resolution of the Islamist stories is restoration of the caliphate. And that is another master narrative we find in the Islamist text. Uh, here the story was that the caliphate, it's sort of a decline narrative itself. The caliphate was an ideal divine system of government that existed for centuries after the death of the prophet. It declined over time because of impiety and innovation and infighting between the Muslims. But then finally in 1924, a Muslim impossible and secret Jew, uh, uh, Ataturk, dissolved the caliphate in an effort to destroy Islam. And in so doing, he allowed the corrupting Western influences to spread to Muslim lands, and that's why things are so bad uh, as they are today. So, in terms of narrative rationality, can this explain the things that we said irration were irrational before? And I would say yes. So first of all, in terms of the narrative rationality of losing, uh, in terms of coherence, uh, that's easy to explain. Losses occur because of uh, basically bad behavior uh, by the Muslims, impiety, the actions of imposters, the treachery of infidels. That's a perfectly coherent uh, element in the story. Losses are, are to be expected in a long struggle, and they're acceptable as long as it's a, as, as, as a step in the path toward ultimate uh, victory, which is, by the way, guaranteed by God. In terms of narrative fidelity, there are a lot of uh, stories from the Quran and Hadith that echo this theme. The prophet suffered a lot of losses to the pagans, but ultimately prevailed. Uh, the Muslims suffered losses to the Crusaders and Tatars, but survived. So there, there is a lot of validity to this sort of argument uh, about the rationality of losing. In terms of the rationality of killing Muslims, uh, in terms of coherence, uh, one argument is this is war and shit happens. You know, people uh, die in wars, and th this, this, this is just something that can't be avoided. In any way, some of these people are heretics, hypocrites, imposters, Shiites, and so forth, so they're legitimate targets. So that's, uh, that's all part of a coherent narrative. In terms of fidelity, here again, uh, they, they, the, the, uh, especially uh, Zawahiri and al-Makdisi and people like this, Go, have published these extensive tracts making arguments about why it's okay that they kill Muslims. So uh, if, the, if the Muslims provide assistance to the enemy in deed, word, or mind, it's okay to kill them. Uh, it's okay to kill them if you use heavy weapons because of a story about use of a catapult by the prophet in some ancient battle. If the, uh, if the uh, Muslims are being used by the infidels as human shields, it's okay to uh, kill them. Uh, and, and again, these are all, all supported in detail with arguments from the Quran uh, and Hadith and fatwas that have been issued at various times. So killing Muslims is narratively rational too. So from a narrative point of view, we can explain things that seem not so rational from an instrumental point of view. So how does this get linked back to individuals? What I've been talking about here so far are, is sort of a discourse uh, system that the, 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 the people that run these movements marshal, but how do we link it back to individuals? Uh, Abrams uh, looked at the same problem about you know, why uh, uh, the terrorist action seems so unstrategic, and what he concluded is that Individuals participate in terrorist organizations not to achieve political objectives, but to develop strong affective ties with fellow terrorists. So they want a community and a group to be part of, and that's the primary reason they participate in these groups. There's a lot of evidence from scholarship in, uh, uh, well, actually the first thing comes from computer science, the narrative intelligence hypothesis, this idea that a narrative co-evolved with human social dynamics and the reason it's so important in culture uh, is because basically you need narrative to explain social things. Uh, there's also uh, a, a, a movement in narrative psychology to think about an, uh, identity, personal identity, as being a life story in, the, in which the individual is a protagonist. 
We've also talked about the same, same thing in terms of the vertical integration of narratives. So we have these master narratives that come from culture. What uh, strategic communicators do is draw on those to frame events in the here and now and then encourage individuals to cast themselves, oh, I'm out of time, this is the last slide, to cast themselves into that uh, local narrative and become part of it. Uh, and again, to uh, Professor Jurgensmeyer's uh, point about cosmic warfare, as he, he says in a 1991 public Publication. That's more than just a metaphor. It's the grand context in which all of life's struggles, including political ones, make sense. So since I'm out of time, I'll just let you read that. That's just what I just said. Uh, and that's how narrative constructs violent Islamism. Oh, thank you. Could you go back one slide when you were talking about the Quran and the Hadith? And um, the this one? one more back. Yeah. yeah. I think actually when you were discussing the catapult and the sort of a, an existing reference or a, um, the ability to refer back to the catapult as a, using heavy weapons or using the planes to um, ram into buildings, I think that's Ibn Taymiyyah. I don't think that's the Quran, and I don't think it's the Hadith. And okay. as evidenced by the fact that the Mongols didn't exist at the time of the Quran. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So, I think that, so I think the problem is by lumping together, you know, disparate, you know, for instance, the Mu'tazila movement would have one view of what is permitted and not permitted. Ibn Taymiyyah, who is very often used by the Salafis. I think the problem is we need to dig down to the next layer of granularity. Because the problem is by reifying everything as Islam, we're actually doing what they do, which is a, a misrepresentation. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, sorry, my, my error. Uh, and you're right, I was thinking of uh, references Zawahiri made in a, in a response to, yeah, it was to me now that you mentioned it. I apologize for that, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, point is still made. These are still, uh, 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 you know, I mentioned fatwas as one of the sources of these, and, and they often, right, do elide uh, different sources. But uh, don't you understand that there's a lot of non-righteous hadith? There was, you know, so the problem is you can find a hadith to justify absolutely uh, anything. Absolutely. So we, we don't want to cherry pick right. the parts that conform to the negative stereotype or to this narrative because you could find an equal number of counter-messaging within exactly. also Hadith and Quran. So this is why I'm saying that um, I don't want to go so far as to say that I'm uncomfortable because I myself am not a Muslim, but I think that this is where we need to have people like Mark, like Reza, like others who have a great knowledge of Islam to be able to, to show that this is a distortion. So for instance, one of the things that we see a lot is in some of the surat that half of the surah is quoted, but like they won't add in the second part, which is, you know, but the prophet always preferred peace. So the problem is we don't want to do what the Al Qaeda groups or ISIS or others are doing. We don't want to have that kind of snapshot. And so what I would say is just, you know, maybe, like I said, d dig down a little deeper and show the surah within the context. Uh, I want to emphasize that. I didn't find this example right. I w I'm relaying examples that I've seen in, in texts produced by these guys. So, so they're, they're the ones that are cherry picking the examples and you're 100% right. So um, in terms of narratives as rationality, um, my hunch is that people who operate within the rational actor, uh, that you drive people who operate from the rational actor perspective crazy. Is, is that correct? I mean, because, Me? well, not you personally, but this, this uh, and maybe. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. Good, he does. good. He does. Well, I mean, I, I have, knowing the literature of the rational actor theorists, a lot of them, the idea that there's a narrative rationality stands in direct opposition to, to much of the arguments that they're making. I mean, the Leightons and the so forth, uh, uh, the arguments they're making. Do you think that there's a, at least, and I know you don't agree with it, but do you think that one could make a rational actor argument that actually these guys are not rational within the context of narrative rationality, but are, so for example, suicide terrorism. Yeah. And there's nobody in the room who knows anything about that at the moment, right, Mia? <laughs> but there are people who write articles that say suicide terrorism 
is rational because, well, one argument is that they're doing it because they're going to get a lot of money for their family, and that's a rational actor of incentive. Or there are people who stretch what rational actor means, and they say that killing a lot of Israelis is a rational actor act for a really angry Palestinian. And none of those are really buying into the rational, uh, the narrative rationality. And, and what you're doing is an interesting challenge to that. Do you think that there's merit? in that rational actor perspective, or do you really think that they're bending stuff too much? Uh, I, you know, I think there probably is for some people in some cases. So yeah, if somebody is trying to get money for their family, or if they think they're, if they're convinced by some guys that they're gonna go to paradise because they kill themselves uh, in doing a suicide bombing, then, then yeah, I mean, you could look at those as, as uh, you know, utilities that they're trying to maximize by doing the act, which is why I was kind of, kind of trying to stay away from the the individual case rationality like that, and trying to look at these uh, these these uh, more as organizations. And it's it's that where the the uh, you know instrumental rationality breaks down for me. I don't know why they continue to do what they do if they never win, if they kill the people they're trying to protect, uh, and so on. One thing that I, I, I think that we need to take more seriously in terms of organizations is A, um, you know, a lot of us are trained to think probabilistically, and, but probabilities apply to the general group. And I, of course, am going to succeed, right? I mean, I think that's something that, that is a bias that, that organizations and individuals have. So you might tell them only 10% might succeed, but they might think they're in the 10% that might succeed. Another thing that I think we don't give enough attention to uh, for the organizations and the individuals is that a lot, and I'm not saying this in terms of psychopathic as some of the people said before, mm -hmm. but a lot of these individuals are just really, really angry. And so getting, striking back at their oppressor, to quote Bono, is w really one of the major reasons they're doing this, and successes would be great, but some element of striking back at the oppressor I mean, and I think this actually fits your narrative rationality story quite well, that, that, that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, yeah. works really well here. Right, right. So it's back to the cosmic conflict, and they, they see, see a role for themselves in an organization right. that promotes but, that. But that cosmic conflict element doesn't, doesn't always capture, I'm really angry. It, it captures the, the, the non-humanity of the other side, but it doesn't, it doesn't always capture the... I want vengeance. Right. For, for at the individual level, I agree. All right. Um, I'll pick up on uh, a point you said at the very beginning, which was really a comment, I think, on Clark's presentation, so yeah. it's maybe not fair, that, you know, the connection be between ideas and actions, right. and, and you were saying that, you know, yes, th there's probably more of, the, of a connection after all. I would just make the point that I believe that a lot of Salafis, uh, Islamists would buy into a big part of your narrative, if not all of it, and never consider the acts that we have in question here, the right. violence. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so if, if, if all the uh, uh, Salafis in the world uh, bought into this narrative and turned it into violent action, the, the place would have been a flaming ruin by now, right? So it's, th there's something that, that takes people with this set of beliefs and turns them into people that actually take action on it. Uh, and I don't have a good answer for what that is, but I do know that, that probably in many cases you have to have the ideation in order for that to happen, unless it's just a case where you're angry or something like that, yes? So it's an, a necessary, not sufficient condition, I would say. Steve, um, thank you. And perhaps I, it, it might be useful, because um, I know you didn't put everything into the, into the talk, if you would explain where this actually came, where, not where it came from, but the other narratives and the, 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 the level of investigation of the narratives that you've done in the past that, that puts this in context. Yeah, so uh, we, this, this, this project I mentioned at the beginning of the talk was uh, a, a five-year project funded by the, under the Human Social Culture Behavior Research Program where we collected 
uh, texts from Al Qaeda and related uh, organizations and analyzed those for uh, their narrative uh, content. And so one thing we found early in the project were these references to things we didn't understand, like pharaohs, for example. Uh, we, we said to ourselves, well, what's, what's all this about pharaohs? There are no pharaohs anymore. Uh, an Islam studies expert on our team said, well, that refers to a story in the Quran that's not too different from the story of the, the uh, pharaoh, Moses and the pharaoh of Egypt in the Old Testament. Uh, but in the Quran version, the, the pharaoh uh, gets killed uh, and has his body preserved as a warning to future generations who would doubt God. And they use that narrative to basically cast these uh, leaders uh, as, as pharaohs, right? So people who uh, deserve and receive the, the wrath of God. And they try to convince people to be the ones to deliver uh, that judgment on the, on the modern day pharaohs. And so this was a factor in the Sadat assassination. So we started looking for more of these things and eventually identified about 20 of them that we find you know, over and over and over again in the Islamist texts. And the, uh, the number one, uh, I think, is, is the Crusaders. The second one is the Nakba, which is the catastrophe, the loss of uh, uh, Palestine to Israel. Uh, the third, I think, is the Pharaoh. Uh, fourth is maybe Battle of Badr, which is about a miraculous uh, 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 battle where the uh, God sent his angels to help the prophets on the battle, prophet on the battlefield. So we just found these things used over and over and over and over again in the texts, and and much of what they they uh, ha include in these texts are stories as well. So there's a very little exposition. Uh, uh, you know, there's some quoting of the Quran and so forth, but. Primarily, uh, their, their means of persuasion, it would seem, or the, 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 the means by which they justify what they do uh, is this, this narrative logic. And so that's really where a lot of this idea comes from. One last question. Yeah, back around 2004, the Terrorism Research Center was doing your image training. That went to the basis of that training was with the narrative rationality yeah. of small unit cells. Doing what image training? Your image. You basically became the oh, okay. For different groups. So oh, it'd, be, okay. it'd be like 40 hours of training. And like I said, a lot of it was was a narrative. And it caused a lot of difficulty for some of the trainees that were law enforcement or military because they would do an operation that would be unsuccessful from at least a rational Western perspective. Yeah. But from the perspective that they were taking with the training, it was considered a great victory, even though you lost most of your folks, because you're within the narrative and you were fighting within the struggle. Yeah. Like I said, it's a different perspective. Thanks for the example. Thank you.